body of Christ is sweet and it's precious. Um, and it, it delighted my part, and I know it delights the Lord's part, to hear you all say that. Um, and I wasn't, Caitlin said, are you going to share a little bit about how you and Dad met and all of that? And I thought, well, I don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's singing that song. I just want to say, I, I, was, I got saved 33 years ago, February 1983. And um, the chains were not broken immediately because I had to learn that there was power in the name of Jesus. And I learned it. Um, it took about a year after I got saved for the alcoholism to go, because the only way I knew how to have a good time was to fix a rum and coke. And so I, I got saved, and I'd go to church, and I'd hear these messages, and I was like, wow. So I'd go home, and it was party time. I'd fix a rum and coke and turn to the verses. But the Lord delivered me from that, and that chain was broken. Um, what I loved about that particular time in my life was that no one at the church said, you should be doing that. You can't do that. You got to stop that. You got to stop that. You got to stop that. They never said that to me. All they said was, look at Jesus. Do you see Jesus? They pointed to Jesus. And so I, years later, I heard a, a beautiful message on we become what we stare at, what we focus on. And so if we stare and focus at Jesus, that's who we become. So I just wanted to share that because some of the things we're going to talk about, and Giselle had said, you know, talk about being a godly wife. Okay. <laughs> so gentlemen, I'm going to wrap this around at, toward the end, and it's going to make sense to you, apart from putting you on your guard about what you're going to look for in a woman. Um, because there's a relevance in terms of the scriptures um, that applies to all of us. <coughs> Tom and I met at church. Um, at a Bible study, a Saturday night Bible study. And the first thing he ever, ever said to me, we were leaning up against the wall because it was no room to sit. And so I was leaning on the wall and I, and I sneezed and I had this way of sneezing that I kind of hold it in I, like that. And when I did that, he leaned over and said, if you keep doing that, you're gonna blow your brains out. <laughs> so that was the first romantic interaction between Tom and I. That's called swag. But fast okay. forward four years later, um, after being in the ministry and going out on outreach and going soul winning, and go, the church was actually moving, we were in Englewood, but moving to Patterson, and we had an outreach with bus ministry and stuff and picking up kids um, for Sunday school, and Tom was a part of that, I was a part of that. <laughs> Friday night soul winning on the streets of Patterson, um, you know, just intersecting, our lives intersecting. And um, so, you know, we realized Actually, what happened was his mom was dying of leukemia, and I started praying because he was very sad. It was really sad. And so I prayed that the Lord would raise up someone to comfort him. Mm. <laughs> and then I got jealous because it was like, yeah, the Lord's going to answer that prayer. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I, you know, we're really good friends, but anyway, I realized then that I loved him. And he realized it as well in our interaction. And he prayed that if this was of the Lord, the Lord would speak to my heart, because he did not have the nerve to say it to me. <laughs> so that's how that works. So the Lord spoke to my heart as he was speaking to Tom's heart, and he proposed, we had a prayer room at the church, and he proposed in the prayer room. Amen. So we're married now 29 years, and in 29 years, and now when I say this to you, understand that God knows our frame and our design. He knew what I had a capacity for, and he knew what Tom had a capacity for. But in 29 years, we've never had a fight. He's never said anything unkind to me that he's had to apologize for. Um, Caitlin can testify to that because she grew up in the house. She's 23, so at least for 23 years of her life, uh, she's not heard mom and dad like freak out over each other. Now, does that mean I've been a perfect wife? Absolutely not. Does it mean he's been a perfect husband? No. What it means is that when he has seen my imperfections, or I've seen his imperfections, rather than we've gone to our prayer closet for one another. Because marriage is so intimate, and we'll get into this just slightly, because I'm not going to talk a whole lot. I mean, I could do this like forever. Praise um, God. <laughs> but um, the intimacy and the marital union, the <coughs> Lord is going to show us things about our spouse. And I know you're all single, so, but the time will come, okay? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7, 7, I would that you were as I, being single. But most of us are not called to that. That's a gift, and it's a call. Our design is to be coupled, 
and most of the things going on in our lives are moving us in that direction. Yes, faithful, faithful to the Lord, trusting him for everything. If the Lord has given you the gift to be single, God bless you, and he'll use you mightily because then you'll be focused on him only. But most of us are not given that gift. Most of us are designed to be coupled, and that's the, the movement that we go toward. But marriage has such an intimate um, interaction that there are things about one another that the Lord will show you. You know, he'll show me about Tom, Tom, he'll show Tom about me. That is for the purpose of prayer, okay, for the purpose of prayer. And even within the body of Christ, if you have the gift of discernment, you may peep somebody's program, but it's not to say, what are you doing? Unless the Lord encourages you to do that. And there are times, there will be times that we're going to have to do that, but mostly those when he shows us things like that, it's for the purpose of prayer. And then when you see that person, when you see your spouse responding to the Holy Spirit's prompting, much, much better than if he responds to our nagging. Nagging is not cool at all. Um, and, you know, for the guy to whatever, whatever his posture would be with the wife. So if what I'm saying is the reliance on the Holy Spirit to reveal to your spouse what he wants. So anyway, that's just the premise. That's our relationship, mine and Tom's. He is an incredible man, an amazing father, um, delightful husband. Um, and I could, I mean, I could give you a list of things through the years that he could very easily have said all kinds of things to me, and he never did. It was always, we'll find a way. We'll work it out. We can do this. So that's the unity. Um, and, and the other thing I want to underscore here, before he was my husband, he was my brother in the Lord. Mm. Okay, and just like I wouldn't go up to you, Chris, and like lay you out, <laughs> I, why would I do that to my husband? He's, he's also my brother in the Lord. Amen. Um, and so respecting that and recognizing, seeing Christ in him. And you know, Jonathan and David said, let the Lord be between you and I. And so always, always the Lord between us. Mm. So that's the premise of that. So I wanna, because we're gonna talk about the godly wife, um, a little bit and then bring it into the fullness of what that is. Um, I want to read Ephesians 5.33 to start. We're going to read it again toward the end um, for a premise of what we're talking about here. I'm going to read it in the Amplified. And when you read it in your, if you don't have the Amplified Bible, um, it's like one long sentence, in, in but it's quite uh, elaborate here. To Ephesians, right? Yeah, Ephesians 5.33. Okay, so in the Amplified, it says, However, let each man of you, without exception, love his wife as being, in a sense, his very own self. Mm. And let the wife see that she respects and reverences her husband, that she notices him, regards him, honors him, prefers him, venerates and esteems him, and that she defers to him, praises him, and loves and admires him exceedingly. That's a lot, right? <laughs> That's a lot. That's full-time occupation hubby. <laughs> um, I want to go back, just I wanted to lay that foundation as a premise. I want to go back a little bit, we don't have to turn there, but just keep this in mind. Um, always starting in the beginning, and I mean the beginning in Genesis 1. Mm -hmm. In verse 10, God saw the earth, the green grass, and the herbs that he created, and he said, it's good. In Genesis 1.18, he made the sun and the moon, and in verses 16 to 17, he saw that it was good. In Genesis 1.21, God created the sea creatures and the birds of the air, and he saw that it was good. In Genesis 1.25, God created the animals and saw that it was good. Genesis 1.31, God took a look and saw everything he created and saw that it was very, very good. And then we get to Genesis 2, 7 to 17, and God, it details how God made man and how he placed him in the garden, and he gave him responsibilities uh, in the garden. And then in Genesis 2.18, it says, 
Now the Lord God took a look at man and said, it's not good. And what wasn't good about man? What wasn't good about him was that he should be alone. Okay? And I just, I, it's a play on words that I'm doing here, but everything God looked at, it was good, it was good, it was good, until he looked at Adam. Okay? Because he noticed Adam took a look around and everything had its complement in terms of the animals that had been created. But Adam didn't have a counterpart. Okay, so um, of course we know that he made him go to sleep, he took out the rib, and it says he made him a helpmeet. And that means they're suitable, adapted, completing for him. Okay, so the woman was made as the completer. This book is called Woman the Completer. Uh, and I'm going to read a little bit out of that, which is just a fun little thing. Um, so from the beginning, woman was made to complete the man. Okay? Um, and again, understanding the premise of what God talks about, because sometimes these things are hard to listen to. You know, women could say, well, I'm not going to complete no guy. And the guys could be thinking, I'm complete. <laughs> I'm fine the way I am. Yes, I need a woman, but not because I need to be completed. God says, you're incomplete, the woman completes you. Okay? So, when we don't fight against what the Word of God has to say, it gets real easy. That might be why Tom and I didn't have much of a problem with bickering and fighting. So, just in terms of the completing part, in this little woman, the completer. This is written by Jack Hiles, who uh, was out of Indiana. This is an old time preacher. They had a crazy, ridiculous bus ministry. They had like 100 buses that they would send out into the community and pick up the <coughs> kids and bring them to Sunday school. And that we patterned our, when I was in the church in Patterson, we had a, a ministry like that, but with one bus. Okay, not 100, but one, one big blue bus. But anyway. <laughs> He's writing in here is how woman is the completer. And so it says, man needed someone to see how fast he could run and say to him, you're a fast runner. <laughs> man needed someone to see how far he could throw the rock and to say, you're a good thrower. Mm -hmm. Man needed someone to see how much he could lift and to say, my, you have strong biceps. <laughs> but there was nobody. Maybe man climbed to the top of the tree. He was so proud and so he said, how did I do? But there was nobody to boost him. God looked around and saw there was no help meet for him. So before woman, man ran fast, but after woman, he ran faster. Not away from her, but to kind of show that, hey, I can do this. So that just to give you a, a little simple idea of the delightful relationship, okay, that it's, now, what do the women get out of this? We get a whole lot. Okay, we get a whole lot because when we are <coughs> completing the man in that way, then his outpouring is far greater as he submits to the Lord. And so I'm assuming in all of this that we know Jesus Christ. If we don't, then you know we can talk about that later. Please feel free to see me if, if you haven't um, come to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Otherwise, none of this makes sense. We're thinking a whole different set of things outside the doors of this church. I want to pass something around. Um, and I want you to notice where the punctuation is on this. So you have to read. I only brought one, so you can pass it around. I'll wait. Um, read that first, and then flip it over, and then read the other side. Do I read out um, No, you can just read. Um, no, I, I want everybody to look at it. That's good. Thank you. Same words, nothing has changed except where the commas are. Either all think this is funny or you'll get angry, one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> this is not original with me. I would like to take credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> simple statement and you know truth be told without Jesus Christ none of us are anything so that is the foundation of our understanding but woman without her man is nothing okay woman without her man is nothing right so it's just speaking to the interconnectedness and the beauty of the marital relationship and how it can be. We, we need each other, okay? Uh, a wonderful poet years ago wrote a poem called No Man is an Island, right? So no man is an island, no man stands alone. Um, each man's joy is joy to me, each man's grief is my own, okay? So, and it goes on. Um, but it's a, it's a lovely way of noting the need we have for one another, and we really do, okay, we really do. Um, Titus 2.4, actually 2.3 to 5, I want to read that. Um, and it kind of underscores why I'm here um, and why you're here. But um, in Titus 2, verse 3, it says, Bid the older women similarly to be reverent and devout in their deportment as becomes those engaged in sacred service. Not slanderers or slaves to drink, they are to give good counsel and be teachers of what is right and noble. Verse 4, so that they will wisely train the young women to be sane. This is in the Amplified. So, I mean, this is, so I'm here to train you to be sane and sober minded. How's that? Um, temperate, disciplined, and to love their husbands and their children. Verse 5, to be self controlled, chaste, homemakers, good natured, kind hearted, adapting and subordinating themselves to their husbands that the word of God may not be exposed to, repro to reproach, blasphemed, or discredited. So this, you know, this gets into the subordinating and the submission and all of that. Um, in this day and age, as women, we'll kick against that. It's like, what? But again, I go back to, thus saith the Lord, okay? Um, he knows exactly why this is a place and there's a reason for that. Um, and again, the husband is not lauding it all over the wife as she submits to him, but that's a whole nother study and a whole nother discussion, and I'm not going to get into that now. But I um, want to take a closer look now at Ephesians 5, 31 to 33. Okay, and again, I'm reading from the Amplified. In 
verse 31 in Ephesians 5, it says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Verse 32. This mystery is very great, but I speak concerning the relation of Christ and the church. Verse 33, and I'll read it again. However, let each man of you without exception love his wife as being in a sense his very own self, and let the wife see that she respects and reverences her husband, that she notices him, regards him, honors him, prefers him, venerates and esteems him, and that she defers to him, praises him, and loves and admires him exceedingly. Genesis 2.24 tells us, um, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall become united and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the word cleave there speaks of intimacy. Um, we back up a little bit to Ephesians 5.25. This is where we get to talk about the husbands a little bit. Um, Ephesians 5.25 to 28. And again in the Amplified. Um, if, you, if you're not familiar with the Amplified or haven't really handled it much, you might, might consider doing that. The Amplified really just kind of has the words. It's not Amplified because it's yelling at you, but because it's really opening up the, uh, the scriptures in a, in a delightful way. So Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself as glory, this is Jesus now, that he might present the church to himself in glorious splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and faultless, even so husbands should love their wives as being, in a sense, their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. So we have the principle of dying here. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And what did he do? He died for the church. So there's the principle of dying that we have in, in Galatians 2.20. Um, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So that's the King James Version, because all the other versions don't say, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Um, and I like the King James Version because it's not even my faith. I have a measure. I have a little mustard seed. I, I see this verse reminds me of um, the relay races, Nobody's still in high school here, right? You're all done with that, or way beyond that. Yeah. But if you remember relay races, um, you, you have that baton, and, and you know one person starts out, and then you hand it to the next person, you hand it to the next person, and then the point man, he runs it in. Jesus Christ is the point man. I have his little bitty faith, and I hand it to him, and he runs it in. Okay, mm -hmm. um, so I love this. Um, I, I reckon and, and identify with having been crucified with Christ. Dead people don't complain. Dead people don't whine. Dead people don't have all these wants and desires and I need and you know all of that stuff. You're dead to that stuff. You're dead to that stuff, but alive to Christ, all right? Years ago, before Tom and I were married, the pastor of the church at the time, Pastor Wright, who spoke here um, a little bit ago, um, got all the single people together and he said, okay, write out a list of all the things you want in a mate. Just go for it, write everything you can, whatever, whatever it is. And, uh, and so folks were like furious, they knew what they want, I know what I want, this is, this is my list. And after they wrote the list, he said, okay, tear it up and throw it out because that's not what you're getting. <laughs> okay. Because the Lord knows what we have need of. Right? So, never in my wildest dreams did I think I'd marry a guy like Tom. Never in Tom's wildest dreams did he think he'd marry a woman like me. I'm 10 years older than Tom. It's a 10 year difference. Okay. Now, in 29 years of marriage, the only thing that has come up regarding the age difference is that he doesn't remember some of the songs I used to sing when I was five because he wasn't around. Okay. Um, but my point with that is, is that in Christ, what the Lord did in his life and in my life, it was just, it's perfect. 
It's perfect. And that's how the Lord works. And so trusting him for whoever your mate is going to be is an amazing thing. He is to be trusted. He knows exactly what we have need of. And you can be sure that it will delight your heart. If you're already married, is anybody here already married? Anybody? Yeah, I'd okay. So, you know, um, then, you know, if, and again, there's, there are different places <coughs> that we're at if we got married before we came to know the Lord and all of that stuff. But if that's the case, then the Lord can, because all things have passed away. Second Corinthians 5, 17, right? If any man is in Christ, he's a new <coughs> creation, right? All yeah. things have passed away. It says, behold, I mean, stop and take a note of this. Don't just like go through this, stop. Take a look, all things are made new. And the, the tenses that that verse is written in means that all things are constantly passing away and all, all things are constantly being made new. So that we're newer now than we, are, we were when we walked in the door. Yeah. Okay, because at the mention of his name, new things happen in my heart, yeah. right? Um, okay, so I want to just cover some of these words in um, Ephesians 5.33, the B part of it. It says the wife is to respect him. It means to admire and value him. So a lot of a lot of work goes into this. You know, there's a lot of thought processes that, that need to go into this. That she reverences him. It means to be in awe of him. That she notices him. It means pay attention, take heed. What are his likes and dislikes? Right? That she notices him. That she regards him. It means to take care of him and show concern. That she honors him means to show respect. That she prefers him to like better or best than anything else. Right? I love being with Tom. I love being with Tom. Even when he's downstairs watching the Giants or the Nets <laughs> and I'm upstairs reading or watching something else. We don't have to be like this all the time. But and it's cool to be apart. Right? That's okay. But um, like him better than, than best. I mean, we were really good friends before he proposed. Um, that she venerates him. It means to feel or show deep respect for someone <coughs> considered great. Right? You, you want to consider your mate great. Um, that you esteem him, which means have respect and affection. You defer to him, um, which means your behavior shows respect, setting aside your right. Ties in with humility. You might be right, but humility gives up its right to be right. Right? We don't always have to express our rightness. It's like, okay, it's cool. I can be right all to myself. Um, that she praises him, expe express thanksgiving and love. That she loves him with strong, constant affection. And with the husband and wife, it's agape and eros. Okay? Agape and, well, eros you don't have with anyone else. You shouldn't have with <coughs> anyone else except your spouse. Um, you know, we have in Hebrews 13, 4, the scriptures say marriage is honorable in all things, above all things. Marriage is honorable above all things, and the bed undefiled. So the marriage bed is undefiled. Outside of marriage, it's defiled. Within the structure of marriage, it is an amazing place to express intimacy and love for your spouse. Um, and then that she admires him. Again, it's respect and approved to look at with enjoyment. Mm -hmm. Admire him. Right? Look at it with enjoyment. Okay, so we're to do that exceedingly, it says, and that's to an extreme degree. Lavish it, honor him, right? Respect him, esteem him, prefer him, regard him, fills him up. Okay, now, as a single woman, we have that relationship with Jesus Christ. So do you guys, because we are all the church which is the bride of Christ, yeah. right? So we can look at this verse, and this is why I said I would wrap it around to bring you guys into the fold with this. Because as you develop your relationship with Jesus Christ, each one of us, whether men or women, a couple of things happen as single adults. Um, God's a jealous God. He hovers over us with great jealousy. He loves us. And he wants to make sure that whoever he gives you to will treat you the way he treats you. Now, I have to get to know him that way in a very intimate, detailed way, the way I just described. 
in respecting him and honoring him and venerating him and praising him and adoring him. When I do that, and then someone comes along that rather than coming alongside and be positioned in the same posture toward the Lord Jesus Christ that I am, I'll know that and I won't have time for that. Okay, I'm gonna say, yeah, no, that's not happening. Mm -hmm. It's not happening because it's a distraction. Um, yeah, share the gospel, make sure you have some tracks, say, here, this is for you, you go over and go talk to one of the guys, the guys can say, go talk to one of the girls. Um, but my point <coughs> is, is that waiting on the Lord and trusting him for that perfect person, are they going to be perfect every moment of your life? No, but they're perfect in Christ, right? They are perfect in Christ, and when we see one another that way, it becomes an amazing opportunity to grow and to have a marriage union that reveals the love that Christ has for the church. We are going to be, you know, you're a bride, ladies, for a day, and you're a wife for the rest of your life, okay? Guys, you're a groom for a day and a husband for the rest of your life, um, which is why I always tell women who are engaged in preparing for their weddings, you know, enjoy the planning, because you're only going to do this once. Prayerfully, you only do it once. Um, but enjoy that, because the whole thing leading up to wearing the gown and the this and the flowers and all of that stuff, it's one day. Mm -hmm. And everything else follows after that. And it can be a continued delight. Tom doesn't like that I say this, but I, I, I tease him all the time because it's, you know, it's like still being on a honeymoon. <laughs> the excitement and the delight um, is, you know, we have, we have a dog. Petey. We had Otis before Petey, and Tom comes to the door. Actually, Petey cries when he hears the car up the street. Tom's coming home, and Petey cries. And then he, you know, Tom comes to the door, and Petey's wagging his tail, and it's just like, and I say to Tom, I really, I'm that excited to see you. I just don't show it quite like that. Uh, but I really am that excited, you know, just expressive. Um, but the idea is to keep in mind um, that we are the bride of Christ, and he is ultimately who we, we will be wed to for eternity, all right? So in, in reading this verse, while it's speaking to the man on the one hand, it's speaking to the woman on the other, we're the bride of Christ, and, and it's for all of us to reverence and have that relationship with Jesus Christ um, that we can have. So I hope this was helpful. I hope you're blessed as you consider what the Lord has for your heart. Okay, I'm a romantic at heart. I love the idea of romance, and within, um, if, you, if you read Song of Solomon, read, if you haven't read Song of Solomon, read it and get blown away because it is an incredible love letter. Um, and that's God's design. It, it is. So he hasn't held that back from us. You just have to wait until the right timing. Okay, and that's the Lord's timing. So Amen. that's Amen. what I had to share. And, um,